Hello health champions! Is it possible to lose more weight and burn more fat while you're sleeping? We're going to review some data and separate fact from fiction. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything. I reviewed a few of the top videos and together they represented about 20 million views. So hopefully you would think they had some good data in there and there was some, but the problem is that they never talk about the mechanism and there is no consideration for health. So a lot of times people think that just because something works, it's a good idea or if it seems to work short term. But we're going to talk about in a more holistic perspective how it's actually good for you. Which ones of these are going to help you and which ones are going to hurt you. The way to burn more fat, to lose weight while you're sleeping is to have a healthy metabolism. And this is something that all of these videos agree on. So they had somewhere between 1 and 15 different ways. And putting it all together, I came up with about 13 different claims that they had. But I want you to keep in mind that these are the claims we're going to talk about. This is not the final list. So don't just stop here and go with this. We're going to go over this and talk about which ones are fact and which ones are fiction. So what is metabolism all about? Well, in all of these videos, they claim as usual that it's about calories. They talk about, well, you do this and it burns that many calories. But that's kind of irrelevant because a calorie is just a unit of energy expenditure. It's just a way of measuring how much is happening. But if we induce or force or trick the body into using more energy, it's usually short term. What really matters is how willing is the body to spend energy? Does the body perceive that there's a shortage or an abundance? Because when they talk about calories, they're making an assumption. They're assuming that we create this change, but all other factors remain the same. And that is absolutely ridiculous because the reality of the thing is that the body always compensates for things. The body always adapts and the body always moves back to homeostasis. What we want to be aware of is that certain things can look like they're working in the short term, but they can set us up for trouble in the long run. So consider the following. Is this a good thing? How does it affect homeostasis? If we push the body out of balance in the short term, is it going to allow the body a better balance in the long term? And if we do something over and over, then we're changing plasticity. We are rewiring the body and setting up a new habit. So is this a good habit? And always we want to ask ourselves, is this a natural thing? And if we're eating, if we're ingesting something, we want to ask, is this something that the body usually needs? Is this a natural part of human lifestyle? Is it what we call a genuine replacement part? Something that the body can use to build stuff or is a natural component of metabolism? So hopefully you're interested not just in results but long-term health. And here's what we want to ask. How does it actually work? How does it influence long-term homeostasis or balance? And how does it affect the body's willingness to spend? Because that's what metabolism is in the long run. How much is the body willing to spend? And the mechanisms in question are insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance. It is human growth hormone and a couple more stress hormones, adrenaline and cortisol. And we want to look at how does this work long term versus short term. The first thing they're suggesting is to optimize thyroid function. And that is fantastic advice because the thyroid is your metabolic regulator. But 
What does it mean to fix it? So they're suggesting typically a few different minerals. And zinc and selenium are things that a lot of people are deficient in. But the third mineral that they suggest is iodine. And that is kind of a two-edged sword. It can help some people, it can hurt other people. And 35% of the world's population live in areas where there is little iodine in the soil. So for those people, if they're truly deficient and that's their only problem, then taking iodine is going to help their thyroid. But if you don't live someplace where the soil is poor in iodine, then chances are really, really high, like 90%, that your underperforming thyroid is because of something called Hashimoto's disease. And that is an autoimmune disease. And the problem with that is, if you have an autoimmune thyroid and you take iodine, then you're giving the thyroid something that will make it work more, then you're gonna upregulate the autoimmune attack. You're gonna make the autoimmune worse and you're gonna increase the attack on the thyroid. So absolutely we wanna optimize thyroid function, but it's not as simple as taking this stuff. Just keep that in mind. Suggestion number two is to get enough good sleep. And that is good advice because they found in people who sleep five hours rather than the average normal eight hours is it increases the stress on the body. It dramatically increases the amount of cortisol produced. And with doing that, it's going to increase cravings. It will increase muscle loss and it will decrease human growth hormone because when your body's in a state of stress, it wants emergency fuel. It wants glucose because that's the fastest fuel. And that's why it produces cortisol to raise glucose, but it also increases cravings so you can get even more glucose. And then it burns off muscle because that's a third way to make glucose out of muscle. So stress is one of the most devastating things that you can have on the body and sleeping more is a great way to improve the balance and reduce the stress. One more way that sleeping helps because it's not just about the number of hours, it is about the regularity and when you sleep and the quality of sleep. So try to sleep while it's dark and try to get into a rhythm, in a circadian rhythm that has some regularity because your body produces growth hormone in bursts. And some of that is while you're sleeping. And if you have a good quality and a regular sleep, your body is gonna release more growth hormone, which will improve your metabolism. The third way is to do HIT, high intensity interval training. And what that does, it dramatically can increase your human growth hormone without costing you a whole lot of cortisol. Human growth hormone builds muscle and it can provide better sleep in the sense that if you play hard, then you're also gonna sleep better. The fourth suggestion is to lift weights. And when you lift weights, you can build muscle and muscle is more metabolically active. You're gonna use more energy. You're going to have more blood circulation for every pound of muscle you have rather than every pound of fat. And if you lift weights heavy, meaning heavy weights, few repetitions, then you're kind of mimicking the high intensity interval training. And now you're also making more human growth hormone because you're challenging, you're pushing your body just like you do with a hit. And all of that put together is going to help you build more muscle and more growth hormone, which is fat burning. Suggestion number five is cold showers. And what does that do? It kind of shocks you. And that's a beneficial stress as long as it's short term. That's the key to understand that stress can be beneficial, which is called eustress, or it can be destructive, which is called distress. And the body, the human body is made for short term, high intensity stress. Things like high intensity interval training and weightlifting and cold showers and ice baths. That 
is good because it shocks the body and then hopefully we get enough time to recover and recuperate. The bad stress is chronic, a little bit of stress all the time. It breaks the body down and doesn't give the body time and opportunity to recover and rebuild. So the short term produces an extreme sympathetic stress and the sympathetic nervous system is the portion of your nervous system that responds to stress and creates a stress response with high blood pressure, high heart rate, etc. And it also creates more adrenaline and more cortisol and more growth hormone. And these are stress hormones that are good in the short term and bad in the long term. The other thing that happens though is when you have a lot of something, when you have an extreme stress response, it makes it easier for the body to create a rebound parasympathetic, meaning when you kind of pull and stretch something in one way, it's going to go more the other way when you let go. So this creates a more profound relaxation effect. That's why people say after a cold shower, they feel amazingly relaxed. And what happens now is you get a decrease in cortisol and a decrease in adrenaline in the long run. So you have a short term increase, but you more than make up for it with a decrease in the long run. Suggestion number six is to take MCT oil. Why? Because it can help people get a 5% higher metabolism. So how do we want to think about this? Well, it's a quick fuel source. That's why it works. If you are primarily dependent on carbohydrates, if you have trained your body to a carbohydrate metabolism and you're trying to switch over to a fat burning metabolism, your body resists a little bit. So if you give it a quick fuel source, then it senses that here's a perception of fuel, but it gets that without insulin. Okay, the other fast fuel is glucose, carbohydrate, but it comes at a price of higher insulin, which creates problems in the long run. So here's like the perfect middle road. You get something that doesn't stimulate insulin, but it's still quick. Number seven is to eat more protein. And protein is not a bad thing, but the reason they're saying to do that is because protein is expensive to digest as opposed to carbohydrate and fat, which get into the system very easily. Protein is difficult. So what that means is for every hundred calories of protein that you eat, 15 to 30 of those calories are used up right away in the breaking down of that food. So it's like the net calories are fewer from protein. And that's a terrible way to look at it. All right. We should eat protein because we need protein. We need building blocks, not to try to push metabolism in a certain way, because this is one of those things where if you make the body do more in one way, it's just going to compensate something else. There is no positive net effect of this. The other argument for eating more protein is that if you eat it before you go to bed, then at night you'll have stable blood sugar. And that's not a terrible idea, but it doesn't have to be protein. It could be also fat, anything that is satiating, that gives you a sense of fullness without affecting insulin. Suggestion number eight is to drink a lot of water. And it's not about hydration. It's about the coldness of the water. It's about something called a thermogenic effect. So what happens is your body has a certain body temperature and a certain mass, and then you put in another smaller mass that is cold or ice cold. Now you just lower the body's average temperature. You have a heat deficit and your body is going to crank up the furnace to make up the difference. So this is a short term stress. And this is where we get into trouble so often with getting a short term benefit, seeming benefit. But in the long run, there is no way that the body is going to benefit from this because it's just going to compensate. You didn't add anything useful to the body. You didn't change hormones or behavior. So it's just going to compensate someplace else. 
What we would want to ask though is what happens to your digestion? What happens to the health of your digestive tract if you drink large amounts of cold or ice cold water? The ninth way is to eat spicy peppers because peppers contain something called capsaicin. That's a chemical that has a thermogenic effect and this will create a short-term chemical stress. Is that a good thing? It may seem like a benefit but your body is going to compensate and adapt and make up for it so there's no net gain. Again we want to ask rather what could happen to our digestive tract, our digestive health if we do this on a regular basis. The tenth way is to sleep in a colder environment and what happens then is your body has to produce more heat and it upregulates, it makes more of something called brown fat. And this is not like your average fat on the body. This is a kind of fat that has a thermogenic, it's the heat producing fat which is a good thing. So by upregulating your brown fat you could actually improve your metabolism. The other reason to turn the temperature down a little bit is that people generally sleep better in a cooler environment. They get a deeper, more peaceful, a better quality sleep. And if you want to give this a try then do it gradually because you have to give your body some time to adapt and upregulate this because otherwise you're going to be miserable. Also think about not overcompensate. Don't put on a lot of more clothing or put more blankets on because that's going to defeat the purpose. The whole point is to teach your body to produce more heat. So do it a little bit at a time, maybe one degree per night or one degree for every few nights. Number 11 is caffeine. What does it do? It is a short-term chemical stress. It increases adrenaline, it's a stimulant, and if you do it on a regular basis, like you have many, many cups of coffee every day, now you're affecting plasticity. Now you're creating a habit and a demand that's going to increase cortisol, it's going to increase insulin resistance, and it can contribute to adrenal fatigue. And while there are some seemingly beneficial effects of coffee, they're all short term, all right? So don't think of it as a good thing. It's something that the body can tolerate in moderation, but it cannot promote homeostasis long term. Number 12 is apple cider vinegar and it can improve insulin sensitivity and in doing that it can improve the fat burning potential. When insulin goes down then we free up the fat stores. The body can use the fat store so the potential for fat burning goes up significantly and there's some other evidence that suggests apple cider vinegar can help your satiety, help you control your appetite. So it's a good idea to give it a try and take maybe two tablespoons a day and if you want some of these benefits for insulin sensitivity during the night to stabilize blood sugar then taking maybe a tablespoon before bed would be a good idea. The 13th way to improve fat burning and weight loss during sleep is to adopt a low carb lifestyle because carbs are burned first. So if you always eat a bunch of carbs and you keep refilling, topping off with carbs, then your body never really gets to any significant fat burning. Therefore, the less carbs you eat, the closer you are to the fat burning zone. You might get there in three to four hours instead of 12 to 14 to 16 hours after a meal. A low carb lifestyle also helps you reduce insulin over time which like we said make the fat stores on the body more available and this is going to help you greatly in your overall fat adaptation. So yes, fix the thyroid absolutely but it's not just about taking iodine. If you think you have a thyroid issue go get some help from someone who's qualified in helping you with subtle issues and autoimmunity. And then there's some things that you can still do and take but do them for the right reasons. Don't think of them as a way to improve fat burning. One is MCT oil. It can be a great thing in a transition phase. Use it once in a while on an ongoing basis. 
but think of it as a highly refined food. It doesn't have a whole lot of nutrients. If you want to use a tablespoon in a bulletproof coffee now and then, that's fine. But again, don't use more thinking that it's this magical tool. Hot peppers, eat some spicy food if you like it, but don't think of it as a magic pill. Caffeine, same thing, have a cup of coffee or two, but don't drink it because you think it's going to do something great for you. Should you ever drink cold water? Well, have a cold drink if it's really hot outside and sip it so you can enjoy it. Don't do it to try to create some thermogenic effect. Eat protein because protein provides building blocks. Don't eat extra protein to try to make it difficult for your body to digest food, thereby burning more energy. It's going to backfire. Here then are the best ways, the things that you want to pursue in order to improve your metabolism. Number one is to lift weights, especially if you do high intensity and short duration and reps. Number two, cold showers, keeping in mind that longer and more isn't necessarily better because high stress can just break the body down. Number three, Look for a lower temperature at night because you can upregulate your brown fat, but do it gradually so that your body has time to adapt and actually create that change over time. Number four, get enough sleep, good quality sleep, and sleep during the dark hours of the day so that you optimize your circadian clock. Number five, do some high intensity interval training. And just like all of these other things, don't think that more is better. And why do these items remain on this short list? Because they are things that are good in the long term. They are things that allow your body to return to homeostasis, that you can promote homeostasis in the long run, as opposed to just stressing the body for a short term effect. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to learn more about how the body works and how to get truly healthy, I've done videos covering every idea that we've discussed through this video. But I think that you would really like to watch that one next. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.